so Bioshock Infinite is, in my uninformed opinion, better than the original Bioshock. No one has played Bioshock 2, so that one doesn't matter. It has a ton of positives and is well crafted in atmosphere, story, character development, and gameplay. Walker. Are you afraid of God? No. But I'm afraid of you. Above all else, the biggest strength that Bioshock Infinite has is its setting and atmosphere. If you watch my Saboteur review, you'll see how important of a role I think atmosphere plays in the quality of a single player story based game. The city of Columbia is visually stunning, breathtaking even. When you get your first view of Columbia in the game, it is absolutely awe-inspiring as you slowly descend into the vast landscape of clouds and floating buildings with a 1920s World's Fair vibe to it. It is a very similar feeling to the initial Bioshock, when you first spot Rapture from the Bathysphere. And in a similar dystopian vein, the serenity and beauty that is evident from afar foreshadow the darkness that lies within. Once in Columbia, the world building is impressive. The city feels alive, having a joyous air about it with fireworks and balloons everywhere, and a crowd singing in the distance. Yet there's still something foreboding about how overly joyous everyone is, as well as the intense level of religiosity tied with nationalism that is on display immediately. This comes to a head once you get to the raffle, and the type of place that this is becomes very evident. The game does a good job of conveying a different mood for the various locations throughout Columbia. You go from the joyous yet foreboding raffle, to the intense skyline escape from the tower, to the lighthearted and carefree Battleship Bay, to the intensely racist and fanatical Crow House and Hall of Heroes, to the slums of Finkton where the poor working class inhabit tent cities and scrounge for every scrap of bread, a revolution brewing amongst the downtrodden. Each locale has its different mood, accompanied by a much different look and sound. The Columbia you experience when you first arrive looks completely different than the Columbia you inhabit in the latter half of the game. But regardless of its differences, it is always beautiful to look at in its own right. I would often find myself stopping and just marveling at the view throughout the game. Going hand in hand with the world itself is the promotion of scavenging. Money is the key to buying important upgrades to vigors and weapons, and it does not come easily. So looting every dead body and empty trash can becomes almost a compulsion throughout the game. You never know what badass item or large amount of money was in that last provisions crate you didn't check. You will also loot for food and drink, which will provide health, as well as salts and ammo, which is critical so you don't spend your money on these things. There are quite a few hidden areas that can be accessed in different ways. Some require you to use a vigor, or find a code book and crack a code. Look, a cipher. A secret message from the Vox Populi. Well, you're the junior code breaker. What's it say? Don't know. There should be a code book somewhere. Found something. It's the code book, all right. Hey! Looks simple enough. Tip the hat to the Vox. Well, there must be more to this place than meets the eye. Tip of the hat. Indeed. The most common, though, utilizes Elizabeth's lockpicking ability. You need to have the required amount of lockpicks for her to open a given door though, so finding lockpicks while looting is like finding gold. In addition to Elizabeth's other abilities, she will also locate lockpicks for you if you miss any. The most powerful thematic element throughout Bioshock Infinite is its cultural commentary on the dangers of tying rampant religiosity with fervent jingoism. One of the two warring factions, the Founders, consist of the white elites who have firmly intertwined their patriotism and racism with their highly religious worldviews, all fostered by the game's main antagonist, Comstock. It gives the Founders a very cult-like presence, and is often unnerving. The other faction, the Vox Populi, is made up of the lower and working class who revolt against the Founders. Although at first holding a sympathetic position of being oppressed, they quickly show their disregard for civility and innocent life, and demonstrate that overthrowing the Founders is all that matters at any cost. The key takeaway is that both factions are nothing more than different sides of the same coin, and you find your allegiances shifting throughout the narrative. As for the gunplay itself, it is pretty solid, but it's not a huge step above the original Bioshock. There are a few different weapon types to choose from, and a few different vigors which can give you powers to be used in combat as well. 
The aiming and button layout are pretty solid and intuitive, and I rarely find the gunplay to be lacking, although it can become stale if you fall in love with a specific loadout and don't change things up from time to time. The gameplay loop can be kept fresh, however, if you make a point to try out different vigors and weapons together. By changing the powers and weapon types, as well as changing your approach to combat, such as utilizing skylines more or going from a sniper approach to a more run and gun approach, you can keep the gameplay loop fresh throughout the experience. Especially in the latter half of the game, the developers implemented more epic set piece fights that require a different approach than your typical gunfight. For the most part, these were absolutely badass and definitely added much needed variety to the game. Ammo availability is much better than the original Bioshock, but ammo is still relatively scarce, especially if you don't find a dollar bill machine for a while, which is the infinite counterpart to the Circus of Values machines from the original. The vigors in the game are a ton of fun to play around with and really add a lot of variety and badassery to the combat. There is Bucking Bronco, which lifts targets into the air, Possession, which allows you to turn enemies and turrets into allies, Devil's Kiss, which is basically the Mario flower power, Shock Jockey, which zaps a motherfucker, Murder of Crows, which sends a murder of crows to distract targets while you mow them down, Charge, which allows you to fly through the air and instantly melee enemies, Undertow, which washes enemies away from you, or you can grab faraway enemies and bring them right in front of you. And Return to Sender, which deflects bullets and can also absorb bullets and allows you to return the damage to the enemy through a bullet fireball. As you progress through the game, you do gain the option to buy upgrades to these vigors to make them even more beneficial in fights, adding to their usefulness and fun factor. The game allows you to have two vigors at a time in your quick slots, which allows you to use them back to back in very interesting vigor combinations. These vigor combinations can add a nice wrinkle to your approach to combat. Elizabeth's integration in combat is ideal. This is not similar to an escort mission in any other game. You don't have to worry about Elizabeth during combat, and she will often step up and supply you with things you need during a fight, but with a decently large cooldown timer. Most of the time it will be whatever you're running low on. Also her ability to open certain tears definitely comes in handy by allowing you to adjust your strategy mid-fight. The choice of your weapon, vigor, and gear combination changes gameplay drastically. As far as gear, I tend to change my setup ahead of time based on the situation that I'm going into, and I don't change it a ton. Loadout, however, is a different story. The first few times I played through the game, I stuck with just the machine gun and sniper rifle and used only Murder of Crows and Shock Jockey, which made each combat engagement play out roughly the same every time. On my most recent playthrough, I actually started experimenting with other weapon and vigor combinations. By doing this, I actually found that my favorite combination was Charge and Undertow. I found that adjusting your approach to combat through different weapons and vigors based on the type of layout of the fighting arena and the opposition you're facing not only improves your effectiveness in the fight, but also drastically increases the enjoyment level of combat. For example, if you want to fight at more of a distance in, say, a long, narrow corridor that's pretty open far away but has decent enemy cover up closer, Equipping a sniper rifle and utilizing Murder of Crows to stun distant enemies so that you can pick them off in rapid succession, and using a carbine rifle in conjunction with Bucking Bronco in order to lift mid-range enemies out of cover and clear them out quickly is a great option. But in a different venue that is much wider and includes enemies that might be above you, an effective strategy may be to equip a shotgun and a machine gun as well as charge in undertow, which will be much more effective than the previous loadout. You can use the grab function of Undertow to pull the enemies that are above you down in front of you where you can generously feed them some shotgun rounds, and then you can quickly switch to charge to instantly rush across the map to kill an enemy that's on the flank. 
thus leaving you in a more advantageous position to light the rest of those fuckers up from behind or the side with a machine gun. Because these weapons require more frequent reloading, if you need to change mags while charging around the map, just quick switch back to undertow and wash away the enemies that are in your immediate vicinity in order to grant yourself a brief reprieve and reload. These are just two examples of how adjusting vigor and weapon combinations based on the enemy type, area layout, verticality, and cover positions really adds a ton of variety to your combat options. And that's not even taking into account all the other vigors and weapons that can be utilized in different ways, or the environmental combat options like the use of skylines. Speaking of which, skylines are prevalent throughout the game and are used somewhat for travel, but primarily for combat. Although they do add a different element to combat and allow you to quickly change positions to flank enemies, the utilization of skylines is one of the biggest disappointments compared to my expectations. But I'll get into that in a moment when I discuss what could have been. As it is now, skylines are a functional combat asset, but rarely ever a necessary one. There are four enemy types in the game that are referred to as heavy hitters, and are the equivalent of mini bosses that can pop up in a firefight at any time. They include firemen. It's getting hot. What's going on? Handyman. Motorized Patriots. And Boys of Silence. With the exception of Boys of Silence, when you hear one of these heavy hitters approaching with their signature sounds, the fun level ramps up to 11 because you know shit's about to get real, and the dynamics of your combat approach are going to have to change real fast. One of the things that makes heavy hitters so fun is that they force you to adjust your approach on the fly in order to deal with them, while still contending with the typical enemies that were already present. Certain vigors are more effective versus specific heavy hitters, and there are even gear pieces that can give you an edge against these bastards. Their speed and type of attack also differs. Handymen are quick and will constantly rush you if you do not slow them down somehow or evade. Handymen are also a pain in the ass because if you try to utilize skylines to avoid them and stay mobile, they can jump on the skyline themselves and send an electrical current through the whole line to knock you on your ass. <laughs> Patriots are slow and lumbering, but have huge firepower and ammo supply. Firemen launch explosive fireballs at you, and have the ability to rush you if they catch you in a bad reload. The heavy hitter implementation in the game is brilliant, and adds a nice wrinkle to the combat. Except Boys of Silence. They suck and that whole level sucks. Now that I've covered my thoughts on the gameplay elements themselves, it's time to address the storyline. The world building and atmosphere are amazing, but the story, though interesting, felt somewhat underwhelming. It feels like a big fetch quest, and a decent amount of story elements feel unnecessary at best and contrived at worst. There are definitely some cool elements to the story, but the overall story arc about the relationship between Booker and Elizabeth, as well as the weird alternate universe aspect, just didn't really have the impact that I was hoping it would. Even the moments that allow you to make choices don't have any real impact on the story, and only affect you cosmetically. For example, there's a guy who's being shady early on, and you kind of think he's plotting against you, so you can choose to confront him, or you can go along to get along. Just a minute, friend. Yeah, I have it. How do you, uh, want to proceed? In a bit of a rush, pal. Hey, mister, you're gonna get mustard mm -hmm. all over your nice suit. I got it. I'll ring you back once the matter's in hand. I don't like this. Yeah, send in the bird. We're ready to execute. Excuse me, can I get some help here? Certainly, sir. Sorry about the wait! Ah! What are you doing? Get the girl! Get off of me! All this changed, no matter what you chose, is which hand you get stabbed in, and what's the color of the bandage that you get to rock. Things like that feel somewhat cheap. It's by no means a bad story, 
Just not the most engaging one that I've ever seen. And really feels like a lost opportunity for such a unique premise. Where the game shines is its character development, but this does not only apply to Booker and Elizabeth, in which their character development and character arcs should be fully fleshed out, but to other characters as well, including lesser characters. The game does a great job conveying the sinister cult-like use of religion and nationalism to brainwash the citizenry by Comstock. Okay, I'm sure I can get this thing going. The Lord forgives everything, but I'm just a prophet, so I don't have to. Amen. Amen. Jesus! Fink instantly becomes the character that the player despises and wants to ruin. What do you want, Fink? My labor unrest is coming to it! <laughs> now, Fitzroy has got the jungle all riled up. <laughs> A man like me could have use of an old Pinkerton like you. Daisy Fitzroy starts out as somewhat of a sympathetic character, but develops into an antagonist in her own right. Get our guns from him, and you shall have your shit back. These are examples of the main character development, but even the NPCs in the world display personality, and you'll find your allegiances shifting throughout the game because of these lesser characters. A great example of this is when you first get discovered in Colombia and you're fighting your way through. You burst into a home and see a white Colombian upper class couple inside. Obviously your first thought is immediately, okay, so these fuckers are about to die. But then they whisper to you that they're sympathetic to your cause and actually shelter you in their home from the pursuing guards, allowing you to sneak out the back door. Tim, the one they're after. Go, they're looking for you. Police, we're in need of your assistance. Conversely, minutes later in the game, you can enter a house where another Colombian couple are giving the police a description of you. And once you're spotted, both the guards and the husband attack you. After the brief altercation ends, the wife is laying helplessly on the floor, and the game has forced you into a position where you have to decide whether she lives or dies without ever having to prompt you to make this decision. Of course, I always kill her because, I mean, come on, that snitch shit ain't gonna fly with me. But the ability to provide you with these moral conundrums and decisions without having to give you a prompt and showing multiple sides to different characters within the populace is incredibly well done. They even were able to show a character arc in an incredibly powerful moment with a criminally underutilized character that doesn't even speak. I'm of course referring to Songbird. Although his use in the game is atrociously limited given his potential and general badassery, the devs were able to develop his character from a foreboding and oppressive figure representing captivity to an ever-present and existential threat. So the moment of truth between us, New York or Paris? No, 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 no! Oh, shit. Come on, we gotta find a way to make this thing go faster. There's gotta be some sort of, some sort of throttle or accelerator. Do you know something. what that looks like? I, I don't know. Help me find it! <gasps> to a misunderstood and sympathetic lonely guardian. I'm sorry. I never should have left. I never should have left. Take me back. Take me home. Please. To a fierce ally. And then finally to a helpless casualty of all the events that unfold by the end of the game.
His send-off is heart-wrenching and makes the player reevaluate all that they thought about this character. This is an extreme spoiler alert, but I want to demonstrate this character arc more specifically to show its impact. Initially, Songbird is portrayed as nothing more than the creature tasked with keeping Elizabeth captive. Once she escapes her tower, his relentless search for her at any cost makes him the biggest potential threat to her escape and your survival. However, through conversations with Elizabeth, you find out that because of her solitude, he has become her only friend and even her caretaker, and there is a bond that has been formed there. Though he still remains a threat, he has become a more sympathetic figure. When he finally catches up to you, Elizabeth sacrifices her freedom in order to spare your life, showing the connection between the two while simultaneously demonstrating the sheer intimidation and killing power that he possesses, which is a weird but impressive dichotomy. At the end of the game, Elizabeth figured out how to control him, and he becomes an ally that allows you to defeat the Vox. His last act is to destroy the siphon within the tower. This final moment is literally the creature tasked with keeping her prisoner being the one that fully frees Elizabeth from her shackles. Of course, immediately following this high point in his arc, you lose control of him after he destroys the siphon. And when he turns on you, Elizabeth is forced to enter Rapture through a tear, killing Songbird. This final exchange between Elizabeth and Songbird is one of the most powerful and understated moments I've experienced in gaming, and demonstrates an amazing level of character development and player character connection that has been cultivated throughout the narrative. Bioshock Infinite has a very original concept with a pretty good story that is at the very least interesting throughout. Its major strength is the world building and atmosphere that is developed and changes throughout the course of the game, strong use of character development both on the protagonist and antagonist side of the coin, and clean gunplay with an intuitive vigor and gear system that drastically improves replayability. There is definitely room for improvement, which I'll demonstrate in my next video which is about what Bioshock Infinite could have been, but all in all it's a great single player game 